the sounds of abuse, both verbal and physical. The sounds of hurt from life circumstances. Depression from failure. Oppression from oblivion. Misconception from being misled. The thoughts that one ponders on from the circumlocution of the sounds of solid screams from being rejected and unacknowledged resonates in me. The struggle to remain persistent in this state of underwhelming standards set before me because of where my origin resides. The background humbleness of my culture, of my family, follows me every day. The view of my dear brother out there on the side on the corner, flipping a bag of rocks just to sustain his disoriented family. Dropouts, soon to be drug dealers, want to be rappers, pursue the prosecution goals. The idea that there's no way out. You got to take what life gives you, right? Dreams are overrated. Dreams have nothing to do with reality. Money is the way. Doesn't matter how you get it, but get it how you can. Dry land masses with no greenery. Make it easy to see the blood dripping from the temple of a young man who never experienced the future abundance of the environment but served this. The criminal mentality that ceased because of his past transgressions due to the lack of conformity and belonging and sense of morality in his family. The dying trees cry, laying next to the buried sister who has never been aware of her environment, never taught that it was hazardous. The shallow, vacant homes next to established ones, where children would play, where the community could be civilized, but now it's been vandalized and loitered. This is a dangerous place to be, to reside, to commune, to even look at. I take a look at my generation, my people, I am affected, how? Not only does it hurt my eyes, but it runs my heart with tension, and it hurts me so bad that my bones quake, and my mind, my mind won't allow me to stop thinking about it. My mind cannot escape this moment of depression because my generation, my people are hurt. They get shot, they get robbed, they die, they grow up in environments where there is no sense of place. When you're born into an environment such as this, it's easy for you to become discouraged. It's easy for you to develop a sense of hopelessness. Some may even argue that this is the planned outcome. However, your environment is not a reflection of you. It's not a reflection of our history. Our communities weren't always this way. In 1930, exactly, they created redlining, something that systematically shoved the black folks in what was going to be the ghettos so that they couldn't own the, uh, their communities anymore, their stores. Um, all of those things started being um, um, given out to foreigners and other people. And you know this was deliberate because it happened immediately after the country completely destroyed all of the prominent black communities. When they come in and they put the interstate through your community and they knock down your business and they knock down your apartments and they make folks huddle into small crowded housing and they essentially lock them in a holding pen. I mean, we, we, we talk about housing and education, we talk about neighborhoods as if it's not about racism. We, we act like folks just ended up where they ended up. But let's be clear, this thing that we in this country call the ghetto, that was created. And it wasn't created by black people, and it wasn't created by poor people. It was created by folks who were usually not black and definitely not poor as a holding pen for the people they didn't want to live amongst them. And then you change uh, the dynamic of the city. So black home ownership goes down, uh, you have a lot more people renting, uh, the sense of pride in the community goes down, uh, and then you get a lot of social economic changes because without black home ownership, uh, that's tax dollars. So that changes how the education uh, for these kids uh, be, um, changes. So brand new books, uh, quality teachers, uh, things like that. So when those type of social economic changes happen, you start to see a decline in education, but you also start to see a rise in crime. Uh, so as employment opportunities uh, decrease in a city or gainful em employment opportunities decrease, you can see the rise of somebody selling uh, coke, crack, heroin, or pills in a city because how else are you going to take care of your family? The world that we live in is designed for you to fail. It's a ball on every motherfucking corner in our neighborhoods. It's more balls in elementary schools, it's more balls in libraries. We don't even need libraries, we got the internet, but it's still, it's, it's a fact. Why so many bars in our neighborhood to keep us drunk? So when we feel pain, we try to nurse that pain with an intoxicant that's not gonna last long? Uh, on top of that, you have health challenges because we have food deserts in the city. It doesn't matter how you try to cover it up. 
there are a lack of uh, fresh food options in the city, uh, such as fresh food, uh, fruit, fresh vegetables. Um, but there's almost a fried chicken spot on every corner or every shopping center you could find a spot where you get fried chicken, Chinese food, whatever have you. But as far as like fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, uh, fresh poultry, there's a lack of that. And then you see a high spike in high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart disease, and uh, other things that are very systemic in our community. Also, you see a spike in issues like uh, hepatitis C and HIV because you have all these systemic issues because of what's called a system theory where everything plays a part in impacts. If you listen to America today, they'll have us thinking that we're gangbangers and violent people and drug dealers innately because of our skin. This is who we are. What I'm saying is the timeline shows that it's not who we are. We were absolutely something else. And there were other people that were mobsters and gangbangers and selling drugs, etc. And whoever is being oppressed at the time, whoever is in an uh, impoverished state at the time, they will do what they need to do to survive. Now, I could follow this timeline and I could completely explain to you guys, um, uh, Salerno Castillo gave the first-hand testimony in front of Congress that then CIA Director Bill Casey flooded the black community with drugs. When I was younger, we used to, my mother moved us to this house because she couldn't afford better living at the time because she was on drugs. My mother moved us to this house, which was an abandoned building. She moved us in there and she cleaned it up. In the hood, they call those abandoned miniums. So she cleaned the house up, we moved in, we didn't have good uh, flooring, we had holes in the floor, we had rats so big we call them eagle, we had um, no running water and things like that. So for me coming from that and living through that, as a young man, as a young child, I didn't know no different. That was normal to me. That was okay to me because that's what I was living in. Man, I, I, I had a, a crazy upbringing. Like, I ain't had no father. I'm always strung out. And I had to, like, really zone in on my talents. And what I've seen and what I've saw is, like, there's nobody looking out for people like me, like myself. Like, it wasn't nobody there to look out for me when I was going through that experience. And, like, a lot of kids go through that same experience. No father, mama is even strung out. So I was homeless from 16 to 18 for coming to school every day. And that experience put me in a position to understand that you can operate in a world system and have your own deficit that no one knows about. You're fighting your own struggle. You're going through your own mess. And nobody knows. And because no one knows, you don't get the help and the resources that you need. As an adult, I would reflect back on those days like, wow, I would be at, at school, a typical 10th grader, a typical, typical 11th grader, laughing, joking, and didn't know where I was going to sleep at night. So I would like to believe that my experiences, um, both good and bad, have created the person I am today. Okay, if I can make it from living in a abandoned house, if I can make it from both parents strung out on drugs, if I can make it from a foster kid, if I can make it from hustling and being out here on the street when anybody else riding dirt bikes and, and wheeling bikes and flipping off mattresses and being dirty and hungry, if I can make it to, from that to where I am now, where I'm college educated, working on my masters, have a trucking company, working on real estate, and I educate and teach students in the inner city. So if I can do all of that from what I come from, that taught me that these kids can change too. Because on a lot of levels, the things that I went through, I can relate to what they're going through. Some of them, they parents on drugs. Mine was, both of them. Some of them, they going to school hungry. I went through that. I was hungry. Some of them living in abandoned houses or homeless. I went through that. Some of them in foster care. Some of them getting raised by their grandparents. I went through that. My grandmother raised me and my aunts raised me at a certain point in time. So my inspiration comes from literally my lifestyle. So my childhood was so damaged, disheartening, and heavy for me that I said, you know what, these kids don't got to go through that, but we got to teach them they can be better. I did turn to the streets. Um, I was forced, you know what I'm saying? My mother put me out. Probably I was like 17, she put me out. And um, it, was, it was, you know, it was tough, but I had to adjust. I got put out and went over West Baltimore and started hanging with my cousins, right to the West Falls, and I was hustling. I did that probably like five years straight with no remorse. You know, I was mad, I was young, I'm like, fuck it. And then one day, I just was like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm tired, you feel? I'm like, just crying out. I'm like, yo, I'm tired of this life. 
because I know what I got inside me, you know what I'm saying? All that I've been doing in the house before I got over there. You feel me? Remember I said, I'm, I go home, I'm practicing my skill set. So, I get up. And I get up, the dude that's praying with me, was ministering me. He ended up being the director of a mission at Morgan State. And he said, if you really want to get back in school, call me on Monday. We'll get your transcript, and we're going to figure it out. Come that fall, I was in Morgan. And from that point on, I just saying like I just was determined to just keep reaching another peak of, you know, like, I'm not going to say success, but, like, gratitude for me. It's just, like, I knew it was nobody in my family that graduated from high school. I said, I don't care. Whatever I go through, I got to do it. Then I found out no one went to college. I said, hold up. I'm going to college, and I'm going to finish, and I'm going to be effective. Went to college and finished. I definitely believe in God. I definitely believe there's a higher power. I definitely understand that the higher power preserves and spares you. And the reason I'm saying it that way is because I was around drugs. Both people who were using drugs and people who were selling drugs. But that didn't become my plight. So I can't sit here and say I had like a, a, a regimen or any one particular thing that happened. Um, at any given time, I could have been the person that was moving large quantities of drugs from state to state. I could have been that person. It just didn't happen to me. So I can't take for, uh, for any credit or take it for granted that that did not become who I was. I will say that I always knew that my calling was greater than myself. So when I was sitting around people, you know, at 16 or 17, because maybe they let me stay with them for the night or for the week or for the month, and I'm hearing abusive language in the household. I'm watching boyfriends fight on the girlfriend and fight on the mother and different people. It did not align with the image of what I knew I wanted. Um, also coming from a family where I had an abusive parent, I just you just know somewhere deep down inside, like, this can't be life. So at 17, I started praying and really praying. Like, God, if you really exist, can you show me you exist by helping me get out of where I am and at 35 I don't do anything without going to him first so my my journey has been an 18 year journey of becoming the woman that I am today that says look I don't take this stuff for granted because it could have been another way when I look to my left and my right many of my friends are not here so I was one that got out I was one that got away I was one who made it so I owe it to them to turn around and pull them forward or if it's not them because maybe they're in jail or they've died their family their communities their children i owe it to them because there was nothing i did to be able to escape it it was all gone if i had to start my life over i wouldn't even went that wrong that street shit because it ain't real for real it's an illusion because like the like the brother said it's interviewing it ain't no rules so even the rules that I live by, and I buy by and I die by, right? You know what I'm saying? I was upholding a whole lot, the whole time. So right now, y'all got the internet. You can be what you want to be, bro. Little, little sister, whatever, male, female. Man, I don't even fuck with it. I want to talk to the shooters first. I want to look at the shooters and talk to the shooters. I shot my first gun at 13. Shot at a guy named Chucky because my cousin told me that he hit his girlfriend and his girlfriend just happened to be my cousin's sister. So I had a 38 and I told myself I'm gonna kill this dude just because he hit her. I didn't consider anything about his kids, his mother, his life, nothing. Nothing about her loving him and not wanting him to die. All I thought is I got a little gun. Got something to prove. I want people to know I'm a shooter. I want to get it in. You know what I didn't see, homie? You know, I was blinded. You only gonna get juvenile life. That's what they told me as a shooter. You only gonna get juvenile life. I calculated it. I weighed it out. I said, damn, I'll be home before 21. I didn't kill as many people as I want. I didn't consider I didn't consider just maybe that was a lie. I was offered life in 40. I 
was offered life in 40 for not all of them for the first murder they tried to arrest me for. The gun charge alone is five years without parole in the commission of a crime. It's no way around that. No one told me that. No one told me that I was going to do 18 years in prison. No one told me I was going to have a cell buddy taking shits by my head every night. I was going to be calling home asking for money orders because I'm tired of eating dog food. Crying on the phone because I need money on the account. Asking for green dots year after year. Crying for visits. People, I got stabbed 11 times. It was people getting raped. No one told me that. The shooters. I will tell you the truth. That's what you're going to end up seeing if you're lucky. If you lucky, you might only get 18 years in prison, get stabbed 11 times, get shot twice, be here to do something to give back like me. Because I could tell you at least 70 names offhand of people that got killed for being shooters. You're going to die. This is not the drug game. You can't waste shooting out. It's not, oh, I might get this sentence or I might get that sentence. First priority, you're going to die. You're going to kill somebody that someone's going to kill you for. You're going to kill somebody that someone's going to wait and kill you for. You're going to be in a gang thinking that you're the one that's not going to get told on and your gang going to tell on you. You're going to be the one that thought you were the shooter, the gangster. And when you see everybody telling on you, you're going to tell. You will end up being a shooter that gets looked at as a rat that jumped gangs. Your history will not be good in this city. You will end up getting sisters killed, mothers, aunts, and all that killed because you want to be a shooter. You know what my mother told me? I used to catch bees until I got stung. I said, Ma, why did I get stung? She said, because you catch bees. Then I got shot. I said, Ma, why did I get shot? She said, boy, because you carry guns. I had a dream. Young guy in the inner city lives in the project apartment complex and his mother lived in the same complex and he looks out for not only his mother but also his siblings and he is one of the pillars of the community. He looks out for everyone, holds it down, makes sure everyone is safe and sound, but yet and still, he's a drug dealer in that same community. I'm here to tell you, young fella, whoever you are, I don't know who you are, but I saw your face in a dream, in a vision. God told me to tell you he wants you to do what you're doing, but in the right way. Change the product, change the game, change the thought process and legalize yourself. Because if you don't, you got about six months, about six months and it's gonna end in a tragedy. It's an everyday struggle, an uphill battle that your family says you could just pray away. Just look to God, they said, pick your head up and everything will be okay. You don't know how lucky you are to have the life you live, so many have it much worse than you. But for someone fighting for the will to go on, giving that reason just won't do. For some reason, you need to get over it or you need to cheer up seems like the right thing to say. To someone who is struggling to recover and having difficulty finding their way. But from someone with depression, let me explain something because some of you seem not to understand. When you tell me to move on and let go, you aren't being a support system. Instead, you're another hand that pushes me toward those negative thoughts as to whether the world would be better if I had never existed. Don't get it twisted. There are times where I enjoy life and there are times where I feel like I just can't get it right. But you can't downplay my plight and assume that everything's going to be all right. Yes, I know that suicide is selfish and what about everyone who loves me? But to be honest, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't put everyone else's needs above me. 
Depression is the loneliest feeling in the universe. You can search every corner of the earth and never know joy. It's a toxic, overbearing emotion that seeks to destroy. So while I battle these demons, I ask that you be my help, even though I feel like I'm by myself. Don't complain, be my confidant. Ask me how my day was for once, and when you see this fake smile on my face, I give you permission to give me a heartfelt embrace. Be real with me without feeling sorry for me, cause I don't need your sympathy, just asking for some empathy so you can see where I'm coming from. I think for me it was when I got to the point where I was really ready just to be gone in my life I just didn't feel like I had a place in this world and I was actually for me I was on Hill and Road I remember it vividly I stood in the middle of Hill and Road um, I walked out of well walked off of the campus and I just turned looked up the hill and I outstretched my arms and in that moment that it took me to open my arms wide and close my eyes I did the most authentic prayer that I had ever done and it was a prayer just saying, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with being done. I'm okay with being gone. I don't need anything else. Um, nobody wants me here anyway. And I closed my eyes and I did that like final breath in my mind that was like, this is it. And the minute that I did that, I thought I was feeling my body like leaving this world. But when I opened my eyes, it was literally people who had found their ways to run out into the street, pick me off the street and get me to safety. And I felt like water and I thought I was sweating, but it was the tears from the people who loved me. And that was the moment that I realized um, that I meant something. And it scared me that it took something that big for me to realize that I meant something to someone. And I decided in that moment that I wasn't going to allow myself to get that deep again. So still a fight every day, but I think that was the moment that I decided that I wasn't just going to lay down and let depression win. Dealing with so much death and it became normalized. But because it was so normalized, I never grieved properly. So the behaviors came out in other ways. And um, experiencing like sexual assault and not being able to trust being in a relationship. So it, it was a multitude of things that was becoming my enemy. And I had no idea because I was partying all the time um I was during drowning everything in like school work partying that was my whole entire year. being like I never sat down and dealt with anything nothing I couldn't form proper relationships had a lot of friends but I would limit how close they got to me I really really had to one apologize to my younger self um to communicate with my younger self and also let me know that today being at this age that it's okay that you went through those things and to let them go because if I didn't I, I don't know where I would be at this point because I was self-sabotaging so bad um, and nobody knew because everybody thought everything was so great but I knew I was self-sabotaging and I knew my process was is was literally going away from me if I didn't address the issues. So for a year's time, I worked at Roberta's house. So I did grief counseling for families of homicide victims. So I met with the families, I talked to them, did one-on-one -on -one or family grief counseling with the families for a little over a year's time. And one thing I always heard was, I'm trying to be strong. And I'm trying to be strong for my son, I'm trying to be strong for my daughter, my mother, my father, my husband, my wife. I'm trying to be strong, trying to be strong, trying to be strong. And I always ask, what does being strong look like? And they never could tell me what being strong looked like. Like, they could put up this front face of everything's okay, I have it all together, I'm having it all together for you. But they never could say what being strong looked like. And what it was doing was, this image of being strong was destroying them. Mentally, emotionally, socially, and economically. Uh, I could tell you there's been so many people who are substance abusers who wound up using again because they was trying to be strong for somebody else. People who were alcoholics, drinking because they are trying to be strong for somebody else. People who were just regular, everyday people just 
dealing with this grief of somebody who was snatched from them, putting on this front of, I'm trying to be strong for somebody else, and at the point where they can't even play with they take their kids to the park and put on just a smile because they're dealing with depression and don't know how. You know, like just don't even know how to have proper reaction responses. Like just completely dazed, like living in a dazed, confused haze of a life. And just because they're trying to be strong for somebody else instead of having the moment where, yes, my life has now been changed. My life has been altered. My son was taken from me. My daughter was taken from me. My brother was taken from me. My sister was taken from me. My wife was taken from me. My husband was taken from me. My loved one was it was snatched from me. It's no longer coming back. The dead and this is hard to process. And instead of taking the time with the family and really grieving with the social support that's there for you to grieve with, you're putting up a front face in the appropriate time and then when everybody's gone and this life goes on and people scatter and you know they go on about their regular lives you're now miserable so when those times roll around like thanksgiving christmas birthdays holidays you're seeing everybody happy and in your mind you're, you're still back at that moment when you was where you were at when that loved one was taken from you and everybody was around to support you and you're still dealing in that moment. You're living in that moment all the time. You're living in that moment with your friends, your families, your loved ones, when you're by yourself, when you're watching TV, when you're looking in the mirror, whatever, you're still living in that moment. So the one thing I could always say is, take the time to grieve, it's okay. And everybody's grief response is different. Some people don't cry right away, but it's okay to grieve. You know, like sometimes, like, when my father died, I didn't cry right away. Like, uh, it took me a long time, and I was my hero, so it sucked. You know what I mean? It was a long, drawn-out process. I think a lot of it was I was trying to be strong for everybody else. I found myself laughing and joking and making jokes with everybody just to make everybody else happy, and I was breaking down. And I'm a mental health therapist, and it took me actually going to counseling and actually talking about what was going on and a sudden change for me to deal with it. Uh, my best friend Chris, when he was murdered, uh, that was a big blow for me. And I can tell you, I suppressed that grief for years, for a long time, and I was trying to be strong. I don't even know who I was trying to be strong for. Uh, my other childhood friend, Sheree, she was locked up, so I wasn't being strong for her. You know, she was dealing with her grief the best way she could while she was locked up. Uh, uh, everybody else was scattering and about at the time, so I'm trying to be strong for other people who aren't even able to be strong with me at the time, and that was tearing me up. And I dealt with that grief for a long time. Uh, I was in denial about my cousin Kenny uh, when he was uh, when he was murdered, and I did everything, including avoided going to the funeral. I chose to work because I was trying to be strong and be in denial, and it took me seeing the obituary to break me down. So the one thing I could definitely say is when you're grieving, take the time to be around your support, your family, your friends, your loved ones, instead of making the issue bigger than what it is because what you wind up doing is having a large, heavy burden of trauma, pain, and depression um, that follows you. It's okay to, you know, take care of you. You don't have to be there or be strong for everybody else. It's okay to deal with things as you go along. It's okay to open up. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to, you know, say, you know, speak up, say something, you know, not just hold everything in because it's really destroying you on the inside. So definitely find somebody that you can trust or a counselor or someone that doesn't that will not hold bias, that will help you deal with your issues and your problems. Don't turn inward. Don't turn inward. Don't turn cold. There are resources out there. Um, today I call myself Tori Rose the Connector because I've learned the power of resources, of really pulling, really pulling people in, pulling um, what I need from each tree. So at 17, even though I was homeless, I had two jobs. Even though I was homeless, I knew how to work. I knew how to save my money. Don't turn in what is important because you're never going to be able to do something like survive on your own. I think sometimes, especially in black cultures and black and brown communities, as a minority woman, we want to be an island. 
And it's easy when you're hurting. It's easy when you're hungry. It's easy when you feel like, if my mother didn't love me, how will these people love me? If my mother didn't care, how will these people care? But you have to understand that every experience you go through is not for you. Every experience you go through is to give you something that qualifies you to help somebody out. See, we need to realize that it is okay to not be okay and we gonna go through things in life. But what I need you to do, if you really going through something, man, and you feel like giving up, you feel like the world is just not working for you, you, you questioning God and you saying, God, man, why me? Why does he call somebody? Call somebody you know that's gonna listen to, that's not gonna judge you, that's gonna be open, and that's gonna tell you exactly what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Call somebody. It's not that bad. It's not as bad as you think because you're breathing. And there's people that's in worse situations than you, but you're saying to yourself, I'm in the worst situation in life. This shit is, I, I just want to give up. I don't want to be here no more. I want to go to a different place that might be better than this. Think about it. Don't do it. Don't leave. You know, it's a lot of people that love you. It's a lot of people that care about you just because they're not telling you that every day, they don't mean that. There's a lot of people that want to see you win. You know, just because they're not telling you every day don't mean it's not there. Don't give out, reach out to somebody that can help you and just talk you through it right now. But you're going to be okay. I'm telling you, you're going to be all right. I was there before. You're going to be okay. Permission for progress. Freedom costs so much, so I'm protesting my peace. Constantly looking for a release and there is no more suppression. Comprehend compression or silly obsessions. See, we live in a world where people can waste your time. And there's no rewind for the time wasted and kind statements are hardly enough for the problems I'm facing. Permission for progress. Sometimes it even hurts to be in love because love's no longer a verb. It's just words like this, that, and the third. Now we time chasing while our minds are racing, looking for that elation, almost hyperventilating. Permission for progress. I thought that my birth came with rights. A declaration against discrimination. Instead, we live in a world built on hate and incrimination. Where's the progress? It's like you got to ask for everything. May I have my justice, please? Are you okay with the color of my skin? May I make as much money as the men? Permission for progress, please. I didn't been to the point where I'm down on my knees. Eyes heavy, spirit weak, thinking about what we go through in the course of a week. Young single parents that became such a reoccurrence. Now I'm just watching the streets bleed. But the difference is I'm planting seeds. Seeds of growth, seeds of prosperity, seeds that our ancestors sold so we wouldn't have to be sold. Permission for progress. Good afternoon, world. Today we want to talk about life being too short to live in somebody else's dreams. Every time you walk into a business, every time you walk into an establishment, it's somebody else's dream. Shouldn't you be able to live out your own dreams? I know you used to think about the things you could invent, and I know a lot of times times went by and times has passed, but guess what? Today is a perfect day to believe in yourself. Stay away from the people who keep speaking doubt. Get around the people who you choose to be like and ask them how they did it. And I'll promise you this, it's always one day at a time. One moment at a time and one minute at a time. You just have to buy into it. All them things you thought about when you was young, I know you might be older now, but guess what? Now you're more experienced so you can make it happen. The day is the day to live out your dreams instead of living in somebody else's. Life is too short. Regardless of where you live or who you are, everyone on this planet has the opportunity to be who they are. And I feel like everybody on this earth needs to see that, especially in the time, in the era that we live in. Because people are starting to forget who they are, who they want to become, the dreams that they've had, the dreams that they currently have, and it's leaving a negative impact on society and the way we live. That's not cool. But if people ended up doing the opposite of that, if they take the chance to be who they know they can be, to choose who they want to become, to act how they know they're supposed to act. It'll leave a positive mark on the world and how the way life is now because with all the shootings and killings and the deaths and or near deaths of some of the most amazing people on this earth, all of them stood up to be who they knew they wanted to be. They followed their dreams. They left a positive mark on this planet. It's not too late for us to do the same thing. We gotta keep that chain going. I, I strongly believe that either you're striving to be great or you're just waiting to die. So I strongly believe that, man. And so, you know, 
you know that I don't I don't do the, the feel thing where I do things when I feel like doing it or I don't do it because I don't feel like doing it. Nah, you just gotta push through that because ultimately at the end of the day, the vast majority of things that we procrastinate on are the things that make us better. One thing my son sees me do, and I talked about this earlier, is like we talk about ball hard, you know, like ball out of control. I'm a little hood sometimes. I'm trying to hold it in. But balling out of control and balling hard for me means being brave and being bold. So if you be a l l, you be bold, you be brave, you be accountable, you love and forgive, and you live free. I believe that we'll have such a a change from the inside out that when people walk through our communities, they feel it. Because remember, it was our communities that our counterparts wanted because they were clean. It was our communities that our counterparts wanted because they were rich in resources. Where have we lost that? And why have we lost that? We've lost that because we don't learn and don't consistently ball hard. So that's what I teach my son. If you're going to do it, do it 100%. If you're going to do it, nobody's going to outwork you. Nobody's going to out earn you. Nobody's going to out talk you. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it to your max. Because for years we've done it and we've done it at 50% for the fear of offending somebody else. And it's time that we stop worrying about offending other people and let our presence be known. If that happens and when that happens in black and brown communities, not only will they start to see us as equal, we'll actually start to make a ripple and hopefully start to close this gap that's existing right now. You have to maintain your dignity and then whatever that is, you know, you got to be comfortable with who you are as a person and never really let anybody else um, dictate who you should be as a person. Find out who you really are as a person. And if you don't know who you are as a person, you know, I, I always like to start with writing down like what I like, what I don't like, what I expect, what I don't expect. And just kind of like looking at how that all measures out, you know, because somewhere in between all of that is going to be a reality. You know, um, it's easy to get, you know, jaded. You know, you see somebody, you know, popping on Instagram or on social media or, you know, even in your, you know, your local town. And you say, hey, I want to be like that person. But that might not be necessarily your calling. So to really figure out who you are as a person, sometimes it's just easier to start with a journal and just, you know, write down different things that you like, you don't like. Uh, a lot of people get into things because they see so-and-so popping or they think that this person is doing good and they don't realize the cost, the time, the consistency, the hard work and everything that really goes into entrepreneurship. And you really, you really have to enjoy what you do when you get into it. So um, I can't stress it enough. Be sure that it's something that you want to do versus what everybody else is doing just because. Um, it will make a big difference into how much you put into yourself and in your business because it'll be a lot of sacrificing. And if it's something that you're doing just because it's the trend, you're going to walk away from it. You know, um, a lot of people get into things. You'll see somebody starting a new business one one week and then a few months from then they won't be in business because it, they've been burnt out because they think that it's supposed to just jump overnight and because social media makes everything look easy um, they realize that it's not as easy. Every day of my life is uncomfortable but I learned to fall in love with discomfort because in that discomfort I have created a warrior out of myself. And warriors are not born. They create themselves through trial and error. And when I look at this area, I see that there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of opportunity to create something new. And oftentimes, many of us are in our communities, whether we're living in an urban environment, whether you have grown up around wealthy people, we need to learn how to find a sense of identity, to figure out who we are, what is our purpose. Every day I wake up, I look at a vision board and I see my definition of success. Success to me is not defined by what we have. It's not a tangible. Success is the feeling associated with achieving something great. So just think about if all of the things that we had, the possessions that we have were taken away from us, the money, the cars, the clothes, the place to lay our head, the relationships, the, the people that we encounter, then what would success be? 
I have the soul of success. And when I went through those moments of devastation, where I encountered those situations in which bad things have happened to me, I've learned to fall in love with discomfort. To, in that process, I developed the gift of long suffering. It's about how you act while you're in the struggle. And as it says in the Bible, not only so we glory in our sufferings, when sufferings produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. So we can find hope in the struggle. It is those moments in which we struggle in which we find the opportunity to do something great, to create something new. More people teach their kids that failure is the opposite of success. That's why when they fail, they revert back to the hood. They become discouraged. Rich people teach their kids that failure is a part of success. What happens when you fail? Two things. One, you get back to go to the drawing board and work on your weaknesses. The second thing is, in that moment of failure, you realize that failure defeats losers, but it inspires your wins. You're going to fail in life. You're going to fail again, but you only a failure if you accept that bullshit. Because it's not fine. See, if you, if you quit every time it's a setback, it's like you stabbing out your other three tires when you catch a flat. Ain't that stupid? I catch a flat, fuck it, I'm stabbing the other three tires. Now. You're going to fail in life. That's called struggle. As a struggle, there's ease. Struggle builds character. And that's, that's, that's my whole life. Everything I learned is from falling on my ass and getting back up. That's the real tough guy. The real tough guy is not how hard you can hit or how many times you can shoot. The tough guy is how many times you can fall and get back up. We need to teach this to our kids. So as a parent, my son is 10. He already has a business. He has a business because I understood that there is a power in economics. That if I teach him how to make his own money, it's no different than te teaching a man how to fish. He will always be able to go out here and make his own money. Not only is he going to make his own money, he is going to have a, self, uh, a sense of self-worth. So us putting our children in position to feel like they are something, to understand how they can express themselves and be creative and, and even get paid for it. It's a beautiful thing. If you ever run across a person, right, male or female, that done well in the streets, right, not on the flute, but, you know, they, they, they organize and they got their shit together and they got some money, then they can do the same in the corporate world. Only thing change is maybe the dress code, the vernacular, and, and certain methods. But business is business. And, um, and know that you're going to have to work hard to prove yourself. Because they definitely going to think you just a fly-by-night nigga with some street money that's going to think he's going to take over the corporate world. Well, street individuals, you only have, uh, you only have one, one product or, or, or one way of uh, selling your product. When you're a businessman, you can expand your, your business to a wide range of things, you know. You can uh, invest in uh, houses, then, you know, that can expand into investing into uh, 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 commercial businesses, and that can invest into being able to hire folks to run your business. So when you are in that entrepreneurship mode and, and, and grind, there's different ways you can, you can expand that. When you just burn, when you just being a street guy, you only you you basically in a box. You're in a box, and 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 that box that you're in is only going to lead to two things, which is death or jail. You know, so I try to tell these young guys like I understand the the, the needs that some of these guys out here are trying to do to feed their families, but the reality of it is that it is not going to it's not going to last long if you don't expand your mind and try to get out and do other things with your money. You know what I'm saying? So that that got that has to be the goal. We have to start teaching our young men to, to invest their money uh, uh, and start generational wealth. Because we have too many uh, kids growing up with no fathers and no mothers due to the violence. And all that money that you have made in the streets is good for nothing if you haven't invested in anything. So. We got we to start teaching our kids about investment um, and generational wealth. Um, and, and like I said, you know, we just we got to 
expand our mind. We got to get out. We got to think outside the box. You have to do things. You really have to do things. Just like, you know, shameless plug, the 52 week experience journal. <laughs> One of the things that I, I discovered that I really liked a lot um, was doing puzzles. I had no idea on, it was my first time doing a thousand piece puzzle and I put it together in a few hours and I have stacks of puzzles at home and I've realized that that was something I'm good at just by trying something different. So, you know, try new things, go different places, meet different people, get, get outside of your, your comfort zone and box. Um, if it's something that you've even been thinking about, just try it. You never know what you can do. You know, just a lot of people think on things and, oh, well, I won't be accepted or they not going to really, you know, rock with me if I try this. Or that's not what the norm is in my area or whatever. Get outside the box and just try it. So, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I used to claim being shy until I got into business. And now I'm comfortable enough to walk into a room and meet people and things like that. Um, you just have to try it. Anything, like anything that you guys out there that want to be somebody, look within yourself first. Get yourself together. Like get your mind right. Have a good mind state. Be in a good frame of mind of certain things. But once you get out here in the world, the real world, niggas going to say all kinds of shit. It's just up to you to be ready to handle what they're going to say to you. Life will kick you down. Life will kick you in your ass so fast. And then, like, you will try to get back up and it kick you down again. If you ain't strong to survive it, you fucked up. I think in order to overcome some of the circumstances that were dealt in the urban communities, we have to make a conscious decision. And what I mean by that is this. I determined success by the moment I decided I'd be damned if I don't beat all of my odds, in that moment I became successful. So it's a mental thing. You can have the money, you can have uh, you know, someone in your life helping you out or handling it, but either way, until you make that decision that you're gonna overcome, whether that's poverty, mental health, drug addiction, maybe you were incarcerated, you didn't have parents, uh, you failed out of school, teen pregnancy, whatever it is, if you make that decision, you can absolutely overcome. It's gonna take time. It's gonna take work, like it's not easy. You can't just say, all right, I wanna be successful, I wanna overcome my circumstances, and then you wake up one day and everything is better. You gotta fight for it every single day. And you gotta remember this, you are unique. God created you for your battle and your struggle. You have inside of you what it takes to get over whatever is placed in front of you as far as an obstacle is concerned. You have a unique thing in you. You have the light in you. The strength is there. But you've got to be resilient. You've got to persevere. But I believe if you don't make that decision, you're always going to get into an obstacle and then you're going to uh, you know, give up a little bit or feel defeated or feel deflated. But if you are like, listen, no matter what the odds are, whatever the obstacle is in front of me, I'm going to overcome. It might take me some time, but I'm going to get there. From A to B, no matter what, I'm going to get there. Seek the resources. Seek the help. Find people before you who've done it. And then this is the even more cool part about it, is once you do it, you go back and you bring the next person for it. My grandmother would say, you saw the napkin on the floor. Why didn't you pick it up? So if you see a napkin, it is your responsibility to pick it up. Four people could have walked in that same room before you and not seen that napkin. They didn't see it. You saw it. It's for you to pick up the napkin. What does a napkin mean in a larger sense of community? That means you see a kid that doesn't have a book bag or school supplies. You saw the napkin, pick it up. You saw a family that was struggling to make ends meet and you know you have an extra $40, $50 or you have the ability to leverage your network to get that money. You pick that napkin up because it is for us not to turn our bags on one another. We've started walking in eye and that, that walk, when we walk upright in eye, we lose sense of community. We then become no different than our counterparts. We are a we people. And when we lose the sense of we, we stop picking up the napkin, meaning we stop being accountable for one another. You know, God gives us gifts and talents to pour into others, not to necessarily keep for ourselves. And so for me, my vision is, or, or my mission is to um, just inspire and uplift as many people as I can. You know, figure out what it is that you're talented at, whatever it is that you're passionate about, tap into it study it, 
um, and just continue to develop it and use that as your way to improve your life, but then in turn improve the lives of others. So in closing, I just want the best for everyone. I want everyone to be become the best versions of themselves and then we can just continue to grow together. I said it's 445 and you know I'm getting by. Happy hour at the crib and you know I'm getting high. Stomach hurting, ribs touching, I'm just reaching for the pie. Looking up on cloud nine, I'm just reaching for the sky. Said it's 445 and you know I'm getting by. Happy hour at the crib and you know I'm getting high. Stomach hurting, ribs touching, I'm just reaching for the pie. Looking up on cloud nine, I'm just reaching I for the sky. I think I need to do some soul searching. I said, I said, I said, I need to do some soul search. You ain't perfect, nigga. You need to do some soul search. Uh -huh. I know, I know, I know you need to do some soul search. I be right, right at that. I go and do some My man soul search. Took the epic loss, it turned them to balls. Translucent, I don't know how to feel, so I'm a loose emotion. Fuck, I don't care what you think, it's never my fault. One of them, long as I can make my point, then that's a start. I'm drinking Bacardi Duck, wondering why my heart is cold as a brick of ice. I'm frozen in every part. I'm phony, they call me nice. And lonely when they get up. Been posed and been throwing rice. Only white I see is chalk. I'm falling into the end zone what the fuck you niggas thought these women loving the friend zone that's when i must have bought see a nigga that been hurt and fed up with all the work he's afraid to give you his all he just trying to work do some soul searching i said i said i said i need to do some soul searching you ain't perfect nigga you need to do some soul searching I know, I know, I know you need to do some soul search. I be right, right at that. I go and do some My soul search. Epic loss, it turned them to Voss. Translucent, I don't know what to tell them, so I'm elusive. LT, think you know it all. What you gon' tell me? Really, you shell of yourself, and mental ain't healthy. As talented as can be, should be famous and wealthy. Steady living his life, ain't one of me to his wife. Should have put faith in Christ, I know it's hard to believe. Just when you thought you down and out, he helped you breathe. I know you need to relieve yourself from all the demons. Every day is going get better, that's how it seems. Need to get you back to the days when you was dreaming. A team like the Sharks, LL, when we are name Do some soul searching. I said, I said, I said, I need to do some soul search. You ain't perfect, nigga. You need to do some soul search. Uh -huh. I know, I know, I know you need to do some soul search. I be right, right at that. I go and do some soul search. Five, and you know I'm getting by. Happy hour at the crib, and you know I'm getting high. Stomach hurting, ribs touching. I'm just reaching for the pie. Looking up on cloud nine, I'm just reaching for the sky. Said it's 4:45, and you know I'm getting by. Happy hour at the crib, and you know I'm getting high. Stomach hurting, ribs touching. I'm just reaching for the pie. Looking up on cloud nine, I'm just reaching for the sky. Uh.